All right, good morning everyone. This is Dr. Bill of World Bible School and welcome to Friday Morning Conversations. I love this show. I love all my shows, but I really love this show. It's just the uh, settle down and, and talk about anything show. Uh, we bring you teachings and concepts which are beyond uh, what is often considered normal Christian conversation so that we can discover more of the eternal Christ who is within us even from before the foundation of the universe. And the beautiful thing is is that uh, there's so much deep revelation that uh, sometimes you stick to a script more or less and uh, only talk about things that are... Um, um, you know, kind of bite-sized chunks, but it seems like in on Friday morning conversations we can get into some of the deep stuff. And good to see Dr. Faye joining in this morning from her office, and uh, good to see Apostle Jermaine Thomas, uh, one of our professors at WBSU. We're glad to have you uh, on this morning. Back with me today is Dr. Catherine Toon, and we're starting part three. This will be the conclusion of our discussion on the flip side of grace. Good morning, Dr. Catherine. How are you, my sister? Good morning. Glad to be here. It's always fun. I love diving, diving deep and just chewing on these just fabulous revelations. It's great. Yes. Yes. So good. So good. Um, so we're uh, talking about the flip side of grace from a variety of scriptures. And, and if you've missed this, go back to our YouTube channel. Uh, we'll, uh, go to YouTube and click in the, in the uh, search line. Uh, World Bible School Media, and you can actually subscribe there and get notifications um, when a new video is posted four times each week at least, uh, as far as our live broadcasts are concerned. Now, what we've been discovering, we looked last time at Ephesians 2.8, uh, and the Greek word there, the, the Greek word charis, uh, charis in the, the Greek, and um, it, it means graciousness, uh, it, it means the divine influence upon the heart and its reflection in the life, including gratitude. And so we've been looking at how that uh, this gift from God, from the Aramaic language, uh, is a word that actually, uh, from its root word, means love. So it's easy to figure out immediately what the flip side of grace is. Uh, and and plus, we've seen repeatedly in Scripture that God is loved. And I'm so thankful, Dr. Catherine, that we are influenced by love. Um, the Bible says that it's the goodness of God that leads men or mankind to repentance. And I have to believe that, the, the of course, repentance is a change of mind. And, and I, I would say, for all practical intents and purposes, a change of heart uh, equally. But... Uh, as we're influenced by God, uh, I believe that the influence is love um, that interacts with us inwardly and awakens us uh, to that which influences. And so it's so good to be awakened uh, to love. So I wanted to ask you a question before we actually get into our next part of scripture about the Apostle Paul. Uh, how much grace can we experience before grace reaches its limit? Oh, goodness. Um, grace is as limitless as God. So we just experience and keep on going. So, uh, yeah, it, it's it's limitless. So, uh, and that, that's just a beautiful thing. We, we never exhaust God. Mm -hmm. We never exhaust his grace, his graciousness. We never exhaust his love. Uh, you know, uh, we never ex exhaust his patience when we're not getting it or we're acting counter to it or we resist it or we rebel against it. Um, he's right there with us, uh, leading and guiding us and empowering us to be, to act, to, to be, and to act according to original design, which is the image and likeness of love. And so absolutely. So it's, it's inexhaustible. Now we may exhaust each other. I mean, <laughs> just yeah. our limitations and, you know, we can be annoying. We can be whatever we are. You live in the same fallen world uh, I live in and, and that comes in through our uh, physical senses and, and affects our emotions. And th th those things are real, but they're not transcendent. They're not the highest reality. Mm -hmm. So as we, as, as we lean into the, to the person of, of, of Christ, lean into love, lean in however grace, 
um, we get to experience, we get to grow. And we're actually in the process of doing that. We're actually being conformed into his image uh, and, and, and being unveiled as sons and daughters. Uh, so we, yeah. this is one of the reasons why we grow, our minds are renewed, all of that. And um, it's, it's, it's really breathtaking and amazing. And it's such a security. It's mm-hmm. such a security uh, so that we can recline into who we are, not have to strive to be who we are and, um, and just be empowered to walk in that uh, and yeah. be seasoned with grace and be lovely. Mm-hmm. And that's beautiful that we can recline into who we are. Uh, so many people really struggle and strive to be who God says they are. But uh, I, we just want to tell people today, this is not about a struggle. If you're if you're struggling and it's based on, I feel good because I've performed well this week, uh, or I feel bad about myself because I didn't perform well, you actually are acting just like um, uh, under the mindset of the law, uh, which the law was literally a performance-based, let's just call it a f- performance-based religion. Now, when we say the law, a lot of people think that means instantly we don't live by the Ten Commandments. Well, you know, it's not that we set out to to uh, defy or to break the Ten Commandments, but you need to understand that all of the Ten Commandments, everything the prophets said, are rolled into one thing, and that's that we love one another. Uh, you can take that from when Jesus said, "There's I give you two, there, there's ten, but I give you two new commandments, and then before the the cross he said i give you one final commandment and i i believe you could actually interject and be uh, theologically correct in saying i give you one final commandment that supersedes all commandments that you love one another so love really is the fulfillment of all that god was trying to speak to an old covenant people so you don't have to perform you just recline into it you just rest in who you're created uh, to be now there's a guy in the Bible, the Apostle Paul, who really, I think, at times struggled with that because think about this guy who was a Roman soldier uh, who drugged Christians out of their homes and and uh, put them in jail and, and so on just because of their faith, uh, who had an experience with God and uh, his mind was opened. And I, I think that the time there on the road to Damascus where uh, that that vision, that light shone from heaven, and you you can call it how you want to. Uh, everybody, if you study this passage, uh, call it what you will. But for me, I think that time stood still, and in that period of time, Jesus kind of re-educated or brought some things to light in the Apostle Paul. Uh, I've often said I'd love to have been a fly on the wall in that moment, but um, really, I'd have just loved to have been there with Paul uh, and hear everything Jesus had to say. But as we look at the life of Paul. From from 2 Corinthians 12, verses 9, uh, uh, actually, uh, I, I have my numbers wrong there, but it's, but it's, it's, it's uh, 7 through 10. We see the story of the Apostle Paul uh, in this passage, and this passage is known as Paul's thorn. Now, let me just say, I really don't hold to what translators and publishers title these sections of scripture as. I think there really could have been something better here, but this is world-renowned known as Paul's thorn. Uh, This is from the Passion Translation, and it says, the extraordinary level of revelations I've received is no longer for anyone to exalt me, or is no reason for anyone to exalt me. For this is why a thorn in my flesh was given to me. See, this is not about you. Paul said that a thorn in my flesh was given to me. Then he names what the thorn is, the adversary's messenger, not the adversary. You could translate adversary uh, as, as Satan, uh, the Satan known in, in the English Bible, but he says the adversary's message sent to, uh, messenger sent to harass me. Uh, here's the meaning of this. It's Roman rulers sent opposition against Paul, so they sent someone out to harass him, keeping me from becoming arrogant. Um, I would I would say, I would say this that that someone say well you know 
Paul, remember, you were a murderer. You were one who put Christians in prison. Just remember where you came from. There's no way you could get this abundance of revelation. Um, so there really is another way to look at this. He says, three times I pleaded with the Lord to relieve me of this, but he answered me. My grace is always more than enough for you. Uh, in its, uh, continu uh, it is continually sufficient to ward off things that are not from the person of grace. That's kind of what I got from the commentary. And he said, my power finds its full expression through your weakness. So that's the Lord talking to Paul. So um, uh, Paul says, I will celebrate my weakness for when I'm weak, uh, I sense more deeply the mighty power of Christ living in me, uh, like resting upon me, providing a tabernacle of shelter. In verse 10, he says, I'm not uh, defeated by my weakness, but delighted. For when I feel my weakness, remember, knowing is greater than feeling. Okay, but Paul says, when I feel weakness and endure mistreatment, uh, when I'm surrounded with troubles on every side and face persecution because of my love for Christ, I am made yet stronger for my weakness becomes a portal to God's power. Now, I thought I could read that today from the New King James uh, because it was shorter. Uh, but the fact is the Passion Translation so beautifully lays this out. So, Dr. Catherine, I want to hear your, your thoughts and input as we, we uh, really dive into this about Paul. <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, there's so much in there. Mm -hmm. I think uh, one of the things we need to get clear, and you <clears throat> you brought it up, what was the thorn? Because every, Because that's made a huge deal of, is does God just give everybody a thorn? just to, to keep us down or whatever uh, this was specifically applied to paul mm -hmm. and, and the intense persecutions that he was dealing with uh and uh so that that's really important and, and we can highlight that a little bit because i i think it's really important because if if you feel that god is going to give you a thorn that the suffer a suffering that you are experiencing that you are feeling is god mandated Mm -hmm. um, because he's trying to keep it humble it's going to be very hard to connect with god as he truly is which is a god of love and god of grace it's love with no that's unconditional with no no dark side he's light there's no darkness in him and so we, we have a problem trusting god and mm -hmm. one of the things that this brings out because in in the area of pain in the pain point um, our escape our transcendent our overcoming whatever you want to call that comes as we're able to trust God in the midst and that causes us to transcend. It's very hard to, to trust someone who you think has a jab for you is, is mm -hmm. in pain to keep you humble. God does not humiliate, uh, but he does, he does um, uh, cause us to be conformed, right? I mean, arrogance is bad for us. It's actually a danger for us. So it's really important that we're not fluffing and buffing ourselves as we receive stuff from God. And you and I probably all experienced this, uh, people, maybe ourselves at times, um, where you know we've received a, a tremendous revelation and we have to fight back, or maybe we don't think to fight back, um, uh, sort of getting puffed up by it. Um, that um, that this is what establishes us as, as greater or whatever. Um, and that's just a, a human weakness that we're not resting in our identity. But I, I love as we just continue uh, through this passage. Oh, and then he pleads for it to be removed. And there's a, there's a purpose in it. But that doesn't mean God is sending thorns to keep you humble. Like your pain points are where you run to God to receive from him. And this is really brought out uh, in, in, in the later parts of this passage uh, when he mm -hmm. says, my grace is always sufficient. This is not um, grace to suffer. It's grace to overcome, right? God does not delight in suffering. If suffering needs to happen because we're being conformed into the image of Christ, that's not a fun thing, but it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. It yields us as sons and daughters looking like who we really are in his image and likeness. Mm -hmm. But our, uh, so our grace enables us to persevere and transcend and transcend. It's, and it's interesting because he says it's, it's, it's more than enough. So it's at least as great as, and then transcends you over the top. This is why there were more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. Not just conquerors, we're more than conquerors. We're super abundant 
conquerors. And, you know, he's not some sort of masochist, you know, when he says, um, um, I celebrate my weaknesses. Well, you know, if, if this is the portal, and I love that terminology through which he connects with this transcendent power. It's like you're using the weakness. You're using you're using the pain. That is part of human experience. In this world, you will have tribulation. Mm -hmm. So let's not freak out. But cheer up, I've overcome the world. Well, you can cheer up because we have this portal to this grace, which causes us to transcend. So we can have the attitude, okay, this is not fun. What is the transcending um, uh, power? What is the, the grace that's available to me to cause me to rise greater than? The other thing is that is so beautiful in this is that it really does bring a position of rest because when we're weak, uh, this is not when we're kind of on our A, a game. We have it all together. Uh, we've got it all figured out. and We just need to execute our plan. The, this is where we know what we know in our knower. And you said knowing transcends feeling. It's, it's, it's a deeper mm -hmm. thing. And it causes us to transcend. And we get to know who God really is, that we really can rest in him. This is not just churchy Christianity you know, Jesus will get you through stuff. I mean, it is, it is real and it becomes real for you. And every struggle that you and I have had, um, where we've had to lean upon the grace of God, the answers may have not come quickly. Maybe we're still journeying through something. It's bringing out something. We can take advantage of it to bring out something in us that is victorious, that is transcendent, that is eternal. And that causes us to be conformed even more into the image of Christ. And so this revelation that Paul had, it's like, take advantage. Listen, if you're going to suffer, <laughs> take advantage of it, get pull on that grace or so recline into him, recline into who you are. And, and he causes us to transcend, not in predictable ways. I mean, you know, who knows how it's going to pan out? Who knows mm -hmm. exactly? You know, if you're blind, there's one time when mud and spit is going to probably work and it's all leaning on, on the person of Christ. Um, and yeah. so what does this look like for me? And you're kind of on a, 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 an adventurous journey where you don't need to freak out, where you're expectant, where you can trust, where you can approach as a, as a small, as, as a child in dependency mm -hmm. and see him pull something amazing off. And usually it's not just for you, but it's in for multiple people, he's an, a, a, a breathtaking multitasker. He's a um, genius redeemer, right? And so this is the invitation that we get in that place of weakness that we can pull on that um, and, 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 and rest in it and see, see him walk out even while we're experiencing um, the pain of our weakness. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, suffering is not uh, of our father is not implemented by our father. Uh, so, you know, people have this in uh, a human nature. Let's say uh, there there is an insatiable need to blame someone for their suffering, mm -hmm. and if if they get the revelation that God is not responsible for it, well, the next thing they're going to blame is some uh, something, some image with with horns and a pitchfork and and uh, uh, you know this mythology. And, and by the way, folks, that image is. Uh, from uh, mythology, not from the gospel, and uh, and, and so in doing that, uh, and, and I, I think the reason is is because there's no way we can just blame one human beings. For for example, have Dr. Fay and I ever got colds or bronchitis or anything? Yes, I'll tell you how. Working countless hours, seven days a week, and not taking time to rest. Whose fault is that? That's ours. Is that God's fault? No. Uh, now, Dr. Fay said recently, and I, I she read this to me the other day, uh, that some, uh, that uh, uh, God, God used COVID to take some people home. So, in other words, God used the coronavirus to kill some people. I remember back in the day that God, it was prophesied that God was going to use the, the Hurricane Katrina uh, to kill some people. And I'm not going to talk about the, the, the details of that, but, you know, this is ridiculous. And um, so God does not use suffering. Uh, and, and as a matter of fact, let's, let's just, uh, from a theological point of view, uh, there are some assumptions now people use scripture for this but there are some assumptions as to what Paul's thorn actually was some people say it was 
his eyesight. And here's why. They go back to the road to Damascus after that experience where the, the, the light of God, the glory of God, uh, Paul actually was able to physically, this is not normal, this is rare, physically see the glory of God and it caused him to be blind. Now, he sat with Jesus in this vision. He was not blind. Uh, he was supernaturally aware and enlightened. But the following days ahead, uh, when he went to the, to the uh, I think it was the street called Straight, and Ananias there ministered to him, uh, Paul didn't get his eyesight back for three days. So people say as an extension from that, he continued to have problems with his eyes. Not true. The scriptures do not say that whatsoever. Do you know another thing Paul says? And I don't know why this is a case even with people, but they say, well, the other part was is Paul had a wife and he had trouble in his marriage. Uh, if you've read 1 Corinthians, I think it's 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul says uh, something about being single as he is, and he talks about celibacy in his being single. Uh, I, I just want to say that Paul, it for all indications, Paul was not married. Now, even if he was, I don't care. I'm just telling you what I see in Scripture. And so they say say that. Well, you can go down this list of troubles you think was the problem uh, of Paul's thorn, but if you'll read 2 Corinthians 11, 23 through 27, do you know what you'll find? A whole list of hardships that Paul faced. And among those hardships, listen to this, none of them was sickness and disease. None, none of them mention sickness and disease in Paul. So, so that totally X's out all of those assumptions, uh, theological, uh, we call them theological suppositions, uh, just not true. Now, one of the things I like about Paul, getting back to this, the true character of spiritual revelations is that they will not uh, exalt you, they will exalt Christ. Now, when I say Christ, I'm not trying to say that Christ is better, uh, Christ is is uh, uh, more. Uh, Christ is this. He is the eternal Christ who in the beginning of time, uh, all spirit beings were created and we became one. So if Christ came in a couple of thousand years ago as us, he came as one. Everything he did, he did as us, as one. Why? So that we might be enlightened on our own personal road to Damascus experience with the revelations of Christ. Our Christ mind was unveiled to us. So that's what I love about Paul. Now, the, the Passion Translation footnote says it, it is a paradox that the greater our understanding of God, the less we truly know and the more we humble we become. Well, the fact is that Paul refused to be exalted in the eyes of others, which for me is the true nature of an apostolic ministry. You know, people say if you have a big ministry, I, I, I just talk about Dr. Catherine for a moment. She she uh, ministers online as we do. She's um, uh, with the organization called GOMA where they're trying to establish 24-7 uh, uh, Christian uh, teachings, uh, t uh, television more or less online. I call uh, the internet, uh, uh, internet television. That's really what it is. Do you know we got rid of our television. Okay, what I mean by television, our television service. All we have is internet. So we boosted our internet because the price was was so much less than we were paying originally. And and last night I was watching regular television by the internet. I was in the living room after work and I was watching something that's on normal television. Now I can get it on Netflix or uh, 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 Prime or some other, uh, all kinds of media sources, but it was regular television and it was a program I've seen on television multiple times and so easy. Uh, so this was internet television and we are around the world. And, and, uh, and so, uh, I got off track, but let me just say, <laughs> let me just say this: that uh, when it comes to this um, this thing about Paul, uh, it was not a demon. Okay, there was no demonic attack. Paul was not attacked. People say I've been attacked by the devil with sickness today. No, you were not. You believe that in your mind, and you'll have a demon as long as you believe in demons. But Paul did not have a demon, was not attacked by some demon-type entity that harassed him just to hinder his ministry. Uh, the more likely metaphor of harassment Paul endured was in his journeys, and I already mentioned that. Uh, you know, there was constant misunderstandings of persecution that came to him because of his faith in the Lord. Now, if you're in an area, and I'm 
give this back to Dr. Catherine, but if you're in an area of, of a, a city where there's uh, a lot of opposition to Christendom uh, and you are strong in your faith, you want to spread the love of Jesus around, you're, you're strong in your message and you're witnessing and just filled with joy. I want to tell you, you could have a lot of harassment that goes on. I have been in places where ministers have been shot, uh, not killed, but, but shot uh, or stabbed or beat up by people of other religions that were totally opposed to the gospel message. Uh, I'm talking about modern times. I mean, I mean, in in the two, uh, uh, 1999 or 2000, roughly somewhere in there, I was visiting another country, and uh, literally that happened there uh, on multiple occasions. So you could have a whole list of stuff like Paul went through, and um, and yet. No sickness and disease at all mentioned at all in the in the, the setting. So so Dr. Catherine, talk to us some more about this because I think this is so exciting because uh, I don't really get to talk about Paul's thorn too much. So this is super exciting. Please continue. So much fun. I thought um, I pulled up the Second Corinthians eleven twenty three through twenty seven, and I just thought I'd list out kind of what his suffering was. So yes. we'll let scripture define scripture. And then, and then we can say, we can confirm, like, is there any, uh, you know, physical malady that God, you know, we're going to sock it to Paul to keep him. <laughs> yeah. Forget. Okay. So uh, let's see. He said, I worked harder uh, for God, taken more beatings and been dragged to more prisons than they. I've been flogged excessively multiple times, even to the point of death. Five times I've received 39 lashes from the Jewish leaders. Three times I've experienced being beaten with rods. Once they stoned me. Three times I've been shipwrecked for an entire night and day, and I was adrift in the open sea. In my difficult travels, I've faced major, many dangerous situations, perilous river, rivers, robbers, foreigners, and even my own people. I've survived deadly peril in the city, in the wilderness, with the storms at sea, with the spies posting, posing as believers. I've toiled to the point of exhaustion, gone through many sleepless nights. I've frequently been de deprived of food and water, left hungry and shivering out in the cold, lacking proper uh, clothing. So there's in that whole list, it's like, wow, uh, wow. I'm so glad that grace was sufficient for Paul um, because that's pretty amazing. And I, I, I you know, I'm personally grateful that that I'm not having to go through that. That is something. Wow. Amen. Uh, none of it is a physical malady. Dr. Catherine, the total amount of stripes Paul received in his lifetime is said to be 195. Right. Uh, that is mind blowing. Really. 195. Yeah. Wow. So, I mean, so grace was definitely sufficient. He kept on going. He was the energizer bunny, kept on going um, <laughs> I love you know, it. because of, of the revelation that he did carry, that grace was sufficient. Um, uh, but it's really important to get this in our hearts, because as I said, if you think God is sending you uh, a, the, a physical malady to teach you something, to um, to conform you to his image. God just does not do that. He does not use evil things to bring about good. Yeah. The, you know, the, the, the ends matters and the means matters. God is consistent in himself. The ends is the ends and purposes of love. And the means is the, the means of love that are lovely that don't always feel good, but as a good father, right. He disciplines us, but not with um, any of the junk that we've We've uh, been maybe a little paranoid about his character. It's really an accusation on his character that he's really not good or that if we're trying to make it fit in a paradigm, we have to make good mean something it doesn't mean. Good the way a four-year-old, four-year-old that's loved is not confused about what good looks like. And they just don't expect their parents to put evil, evil things on them, destructive uh -huh. things on them to teach them or keep them humble or whatever that is. Well, I mean, our, 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 our father is better than that. And so there's no darkness. And so you can trust him in the midst of suffering, even to the point of the list that I, you know, listed here in your suffering, in your pain point, pain point, you can trust this God that he's going to bring about something through his grace because he loves you. And he's going to bring something beautiful and powerful and uh, redemptive on the other side. He's not punitive. He is redemptive. He's not punishing yes. kids. 
He's redeeming his kids. He's healing his kids. Uh, and, and in the midst of it all, because we do live in a world where we do have tribulation, we can cheer up with that overcoming transcendent power because we're loved, because we're one with him, because he chose us and we get to choose him back. Uh, we, we get to learn things in the midst and it gets to be redeemed, but it's not sent to teach. It's not sent to, um, to uh, keep us down. It's just a good God is actually like good in the way that your heart needs him to be good. Amen. Amen. And you know, you know, Dr. Catherine, I was raised in very religious circles. Uh, let, let me just say this to all of my Pentecostal friends out there. Um, I was raised in one of the three largest denominations in the world at the time, which was a Pentecostal denomination. And I was, and I'm not saying all Pentecostals are like this. I'm not saying that everybody that, I mean, I went from there to uh, the, the charismatic movement, I, I, and they had some fallacies in their beliefs. I went to, to the, the Word of Faith movement for many years, uh, to the Kingdom uh, movement, which is a little bit different, um, uh, probably more like Word of Faith than they realize, but, but still. And, and then I went to the Grace Movement as far as a movement. But the thing that I've learned is not to camp in a movement, not to build a, a tabernacle in a movement, but just keep flowing with God as revelation continues to, to grow and, and unfold to me. But in my Pentecostal uh, denomination, I was, uh, all of my life as a child, up to 10 years of adult ministry in that denomination. And what I learned is, is I learned that we believed it that all suffering came from God. Now, there was a devil who implemented some stuff and this kind of stirred up the pot, but God basically was behind it. If God didn't do it, God allowed it. And, you know, and you get to thinking about that. Uh, here's a father who says he loves me unconditionally, but on occasion, he's going to punish me, maybe for his amusement. Maybe because I haven't learned what I need to learn, uh, but um, uh, you know, and so I, I just went through. Uh, my wife and I just went through uh, the coronavirus. We we don't get sick. I'm telling you, we do not get sick. But but uh, uh, other than the abuse of our own body with with hours and hours of stuff. But anyway, this was was something that we were just casually visiting, and boom, a few days we come down with coronavirus. Now, uh, for me. I was started getting better in the third week. My wife was was out of uh, the the school for four weeks, um, you know, and just little by little working your way back in. Uh, but I did a video uh, about how I um, how I got through uh, the COVID uh, the coronavirus, and the two things that really blessed me is one the entire time. Okay, I'm telling you. If you've not had the, a, a bad case of coronavirus, uh, you may not, you, you, you know, you may say, well, I had the coronavirus for a couple of days and I started getting better. That's wonderful. I'm telling you, for two weeks solid, the, the most horrible feeling, not feeling like eating, feeling miserable, you drag yourself out of bed, you go to the living room, get in the recliner or something, you spend all day there, then you go back to bed that night and day after day. And the, 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 how I got through it is, one, the entire time I knew that I was God's son. I knew I was a son of God. Paul says, I live by the faith of the son of God in the King James, but actually it's in the Greek, it's by the faith of a son of God. So that's son or daughter of God. And then the second thing that got me through, the entire time I declared within myself that I am as whole as my father is whole. See, that has to be true if as he is, so am I in this world. So here I was in this world. Man, suffering. I knew it wasn't from my father, but I knew I was as whole as he was whole. Now, did it take some time? Yes. Should it have been an instantaneous miracle? Of course, probably so. But you know what? I learned something very valuable. I, I learned that I could know and declare who I was throughout no matter what. And I think that's an important thing to, to realize because, you know, here again, Paul has uh, dealt, dealt, had dealt with this thing with the Roman government. And I remember one time, was it First Corinthians chapter 1, where he, he was uh, said, I you know, I don't want to go to Rome and I don't want to go preach. He said, okay, now I'm ready. <laughs> I mean, after, after the Lord speaking to him and telling him how powerful, 
powerful the gospel was in him. And, um, you know, the, the, the Amplified in verse 9 says, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. My loving kindness and my mercy are more than enough, always available, regardless of my situation. For my power is being perfected and is completed and shows itself more effectively uh, in your weakness. Uh, Dr. K. Fairchild writes, that's why sickness and etc. Uh, has no power because it has no sub no true substance since it is not from God. And that's amazing. Uh, Dr. Catherine, talk to us some more, please. Wow. Well, uh, you know, I, I think as, as, as pretty much everything that we are kind of walking out, you know, because we do have a tendency, you know, why me? Why, you know, <laughs> yeah. how did this happen? You know, who's to blame? And, you know, and, and it's important that we do exert some discipline with where our mind wants to head because it, it's suffering is painful. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, um, and, and none of us is going to escape a pain-free life. And this is, these are one of the things that, you know, as we're bringing up our kids and things like that, that they have to, they learn. It's like how, you know, life does have painful things, but our, our, our rock and our grounding is in a God who's wild about us and who is causes us to transcend. And, you know, and, and I, I love the way you kind of put it because you were talking about, well, you know, does healing come? Absolutely. Healing was coming when I was really feeling awful. I was dragging myself. I didn't want to eat. I was so tired, whatever. This is not like, I, I can't really relate to that, but this is kind of what I'm experiencing in the experience. Um, having that, uh, having a track record with God, who actually, you know, to this point with whatever you're experiencing now, guess what? You've already overcome a, a myriad of things. And we tend to forget Amen. This is our track record. This is why the Israelites set memorials because they, they needed it in front of them to remind us, well, if I overcame this, I can overcome what I'm coming through now. And this is not just me in and of myself in a humanistic time, kind of religion that, I, it, that I'm you know, just pulling myself up my bootstraps. It's in our union and dependency that we can rest upon a God who is greater, who's sweeping. You know, love never fails. So one way or the other, love's yeah. not going to fail in your life. So what does that look like as we walk out in, 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 in time, right? In where we're at? Well, you know, I, I have lots of, lots of things where, you know, I've got testimonies where there's been instantaneous miracles, hallelujah. And then there's been things where I've had to walk it out, but either way, um, at the end of the day, you, you will overcome, you will transcend. Why? Because his grace is sufficient. This is not dependent upon you. It's dependent on you and him together. It's really dependent on him. And the fact that you're already one, that it's already been established. Um, that's where you look. And that's why he said, keep looking at me, look unto me, the author and finisher of faith. I started this puppy. I, I will finish it. This is about you and him and the track record that you already have, because you have experienced the goodness of God that that's really good. Not this kind of religious muddy mess that religion make it, but that's really good where he's brought you through and he's brought you through and he's brought you through. And we tend to be forgetful. That's the weakness of our frame. And that's where we need to remind ourselves and remind one another. This is one of the reasons why you do what you do and why I do what I do to re remind ourselves, remind one another, wait a second. And whatever you're going through, it may look bad. It may look mm -hmm. horrible. And it certainly feels horrible. And that is, you know, that's a, that's an experience, but there's a greater experience as you really um, connect with God inside and allow him to bring about the redemption of all of it. And, you know, he doesn't just redeem. So, you know, like you had COVID and you're healed from COVID. No, as, as you're walking it through with him, there's something about that, that causes you to, um, to be enlarged in who you are and enlarged in your relationship with God. So it's like, there's a bonus. So um, it's not like it's a reward for suffering, but it's as it ever, as, as we engage with God, we literally un, uh, are unveiled in, in a higher, le uh, uh, um, less um, covered version of who we are. Mm -hmm. So there's an upgrade. There's an upgrade in our mindset because you got through the COVID thing, knowing who you were, knowing who God is. 
and are able to walk that out. And so every single um, challenge that we have, we can discipline ourselves to keep our focus on, on, on Jesus. And, and, and it's helpful just to remember, no, he, no, wait a second. He brought me through that. He brought me through that. He, he's going to bring me through this and I'm going to come mm-hmm. out stronger on the other side. Uh, so God never leaves you smaller than where you were. There's always an upgrade. And it's not that he's changing you as if you're not that, but he's unveiling who you already are, who the eternal you is are whatever the correct grammar (laughs) that is um and so there there's something in that um that god um takes advantage of in the process so which means we we do go from glory to glory we do grow from faith to faith we do Mm -hmm. go from grace to grace we do grow from strength to strength we do go from one degree of 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 of, uh light to Mm it to something that's brighter and this is where he's walking us out and it is inevitable as we keep our eyes on 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 jesus and you know we have a tendency to look at the wind and waves and that's just the human frame but that ability to keep focus that he, he empowers us to do. We're not, we're not like duking this out in our own strength. You know, I, I love uh, Philippians 2 13 that talks about the amplified version that says, um, uh, not in your own strength, but is God who is all the while effectually at work in you, energizing and creating you the power and desire to will and to work for his good pleasure, satisfaction, and delight. That's grace. That's empowerment. Amen. That's you engaging with the per- person of love who you're one with. Amen. Amen. And and let me just say that in eternity past, uh, at the time of creation, and we're talking about pre-Adam, we're talking about pre-Garden, God created you to be who you are, which is the reflection of himself. Now, having said that, uh, Elizabeth Ketchings uh, writes that everyone already has the victory, we should have the mindset, that mindset continually. Uh, That means that uh, the three Hebrew children went into a fiery furnace and they uh, came out, their clothes were not burned, their their hair on their head was not singed. Uh, Here's the thing, they came through it and on the other side, they didn't even smell like smoke. Now, you can go through coronavirus. That is the, the, the biggest thing going on right now as far as physical stuff. A lot of people are dying. A lot of people are, are sick. A lot of people come out of it with, with breathing problems. Uh, look, you can go through it and come out not smelling like coronavirus. Okay? Uh, you can go through, uh, and God forbid, uh, but you can go through a... Um, uh, let, let me let me put it this way. I'm trying to be gentle with this, but you can go through a financial crisis, complete a complete financial devastation in your life, and come out of it not smelling like a financial devastation. Okay, it's so beautiful. So Paul writes here. Uh, I think what he's writing is what Father is speaking to him, as he hears Father saying, "My grace is." always more than enough for you. I think that's the way I think he would say it. It could be rendered as my grace is continuously sufficient in you to ward off. Now, why the uh, the uh, he, the Greek would say to ward off or to ward it off and stop there, uh, I would have liked to see someone expound on that just a little bit more in the footnotes. But here's the thing about it. Uh, once you are awakened and enlightened to the person of grace, and, and I want to say this, uh, you can read in the book of Titus, and especially from the Passion Translation, and you can find out who the person of grace is. It's very made very clear. I think it's about verse 9, 10, or 11, somewhere in there. And, and in that place of knowing him within you, knowing who he is within you, as he is, so are you. That is said to ward off all things that are not from the person of grace. So uh, think about this. I, I used to say this all the time. Jesus shares right after the Beatitudes, and he's talking about the section that's labeled Love Your Enemies in Matthew chapter 5. Do you know what he says in there? And, and I'll, just, I'll just read it to you real quick from the, the New King James. He says, verse 45, uh, that... 
uh, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. So I was, I used to say, well, you know, that's why stuff happens. Now, uh, I, I guess I just haven't said it for a while, uh, but that's why stuff happens. There's just stuff that happens because there's good and bad people or just and unjust people in the world who, who some have, have uh, changed their mindset, have repented, they've had a change of mind, and some haven't. But guess what? If the clouds form in the sky, they get a little dark and rain begins to fall, uh, I hope the significance is, is that's going to rain on everybody unless you learn how to get an umbrella. <laughs> and then it's not going to rain on you. Well, I'd like to think that uh, Psalm 91, uh, verse 1 and 2, talks about dwelling in the secret place of the Most High and that, that he, he, he's, uh, he, we hide in the shadow of and, and I like to think about the shadow or the tabernacle of God, the, the dwelling of God as an umbrella that shields us from some stuff. Now, did, did I know that I was shielded from coronavirus before I got coronavirus? Absolutely. But it came, just like it came on other people around us who were maybe not believers in Jesus. But do you know what? I believe that knowing who I was, and, and I don't know why I'm talking about this this morning, but I believe that knowing who I was and knowing that I'm as whole as my father is whole was the umbrella for me that caused me to come out on the other side. Even though it rained, I wasn't wet. I didn't smell like coronavirus. I didn't taste like coronavirus. And so, yeah, yeah it, it takes a toll on the human body. But I'm trying to live from a supernatural perspective, not from a human perspective. So I just thought that was really significant. Paul says, look, uh, God tells him, you know what, my grace, okay? Not your grace, Paul, but my grace is sufficient for you. It's going to get you through no matter all of these things, this list of stuff Dr. Catherine read, no matter what's going on in your human experience, no matter when you seem to be weak, no, no matter what's going on, there will seem to be a deeper sense of knowing within of the mighty power of the eternal Christ living in you. No matter what it feels like, you are strong because the one who created you uh, is the one strength within you. There's one strength and that strength encompasses you. Um, Dr. Catherine, please, I'm I'm rambling so much. No, it's great ramble. It's great ramble because the thing is this where, where, where we can talk about lofty subjects and that's so fun. And to just, to, you know, uh, speculate and, to, and I love it, but where people are suffering and we're, we're really talking about the places where people are suffering, right? Where mm -hmm. it feels like life is thorny and they're perplexed and all of that. And, you know, in, in, in your emotions, in your body, you, you feel it. Okay. And there's no condemnation for uh, actually feeling uh, the pain or the suffering. But in the midst of that, in the midst of all that, there's an answer that's bigger than the problem. There's an answer to bring you through. And sometimes I, I know a lot of people as I, as I do coaching some things are, you know, really baffled, like what, you know, God, why don't you do the magic wand? You know, like, bam, you know, shaka bam, we're all the charismatic thing, right? It just happens, signs, wonders, miracles. Great. Let's, I vote for all of those, seen them and then seen where that's not been, been how it's walked out. But there's something about you depending on the one in you, depending on the person of love who is grace um, in you and journeying that out where your relationship with God just flourishes. You see, if, if God, if God's answer and his grace is just a bam, get you out of every single yucky situation. Um, and I'm not saying he, those things don't happen, but it doesn't always happen that way. And sometimes people, I think people, particularly in the charismatic movement, feel really condemned. That's something, you know, there's something wrong with them. Their faith isn't good enough. They haven't worked it up, whatever that is. Yeah, um, yeah. That's really a trap. But sometimes there's something about in that relationship. It's all about relationship. God is love. He is always, it will always be relational. A magic wand is not relational. And so uh, where you're kind of walking it out and it took three weeks to get over, it took whatever it is, there's something about you engaging with the person where you're, you're flowing in that, that stream of, uh, of the grace that's being poured out, where you're dependent and he comes through and he comes through and he comes through that your relationship with him, your intimacy, 
see with him, your ability to trust in spite of, you know what, you don't need to trust someone when there's nothing wrong. Right. Mm -hmm. So if, if, if I'm, if I'm not lost, I don't need to trust someone to, you know, lead me out. But when I'm seriously lost, like, I don't know where I'm doing and I'm, and I'm having to depend, depend on my GPS. I'm having to trust that GPS that, you know, oh, yeah. there, right. So, but it's that place where God is, is you are engaging with God and he's showing himself strong to you in a personal way that addresses the pain, that the pain eventually melts away, that eventually you transcend it. And you have this huge track track record. You know this is this is as we're gazing at at, at God as in a mirror. We're literally being tra tra transfigured um, into that very image. We're being so he's 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 using it all. He doesn't bring it, but man, if it came, he will take advantage of it on your behalf. Mm -hmm. But our our ability to uh, to walk this out is all about that dependency, all about knowing him so you can rest. You know, I, a lot of times I, I have this thing that I do that helps me. <laughs> and that is when something comes up and I find myself starting to get upset, right? And, and sometimes usually it's stupid things and just to, you know, full disclosure, but, um, but the big things usually I can handle pretty well. It's usually the stupid things. And I literally have to grab a hold of myself and I say, Catherine, nobody panic. Right. Because, yeah. because in the place where I might run to fear, I might run to whatever I said, wait a second, oh, check yourself. Wait, I'm, I'm rooted and grounded in love. I am one with the person of what love. I'm one with the person of grace who has never failed me, who is, who is causing these things to work for my good and that he's not man that he should lie, but he's causing me to transcend in the midst. And this is where his, his strength is made perfect in my weakness. Cause I, I'm leaning on him. It's like, if God, if, if God doesn't, doesn't help me through this, it does help us humanity through this. We're all going down except for that he refuses to leave us alone. He refuses to, um, to be tapped out. Like there's only so much grace they have for you. And if you can't get it with this much grace, you know, you know, really bummer for you. No, there's yes. all this grace. It's continuously flowing. And it's in this place of our intimacy with him, our union with him, where that is, is released and flows. And wow, we have an experiential, um, uh, uh, uh encounter with the person of grace where Manny came through and Manny came through and Manny came through. So the next thing that's that, that you're going to come upon, sorry, probably this is not the only thing you will suffer with. Um, the next thing it's like, wow, I have this track record. I can do this. I'm, I come out larger, a larger upgraded version of myself and my uh, history with him, my experience with him. And then I also have more to give because I, I've had to maybe dig deeper uh, because it's in, in me. I've had to pull deeper on something that is eternal. That was not in front of my eyes. That was not in my feelings, but it was in my knower, in my experience. And it literally yes. is, um, comes from the inside out. And that's every single person as we will engage engage in that capacity. So love truly never fails. He's never outdone. He always has a bigger answer than the problem. And we get to experience it and walk it out and be a source of, of, of hope and strength for other people who are struggling and maybe have forgotten or maybe have not experienced this, but you're able to experience it. This is your inheritance as a son and daughter of God. Amen. Amen. Absolutely. And, and uh, you know, when it comes to what people are suffering with and where, where you're at, uh, take this piece that Dr. Catherine just said and, and you know, do a self-check. Uh, why is it that's pushing your button and, and why are you letting it? Because uh, the person of love uh, is within you. I, I'll, I'll say this, Father's grace becomes a revelation of being more than enough. And I think that's what the Apostle Paul uh, was really experiencing. Also, this could read, uh, the power of Christ rests upon me like a tent or a tabernacle providing me shelter. Uh, I love that. There's my umbrella. Uh, Dr. Faye says, um, uh, that's why we give all credit uh, uh, to our loving uh, Father God. Uh, he brings us through stuff, you know, uh, and um, so, so powerful. Uh, so anyway, 
uh, the, the fact that uh, when Paul tends to view himself as weak, he somehow taps into a deeper sense of knowing that the power of God, who is grace, living within him. And I think what happens with all of us is we, we begin to sense a shift uh, in in uh, to his mind or to a higher realm of thinking that God's grace is the divine influence that reveals within us a state of, like we talked about last week in the definition of, gra- of grace, uh, cheerfulness, um, calmly happy, uh, well off. And that seems to be a motivation within us to live by faith and to allow love's influence to produce a better state of mind. And I said that last week because we talked about how to have a better quality of life. Basically, you know, what I tell people that are going through things, Dr. Catherine, is you do realize that if you think differently, if you think positively, uh, don't focus on the bad, but focus on how, how wonderful God is. Uh, that actually can change the scenario of what you're going through. Um, when when we live by the Christ mind of knowing that we're loved, and I think this is so so important. Uh, and, and let me just say, it can it can take some time to get this down, so to speak. You know, practice this. You know, reminding yourself of how much God loves you, uh, 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 knowing that we're loved. It should change your entire mental attitude toward life, toward excess, and overall how we see others. Because quite honestly, how we see ourselves generally tends to be projected in how we see other people. So if we're down on ourselves and kind of in this grumpy attitude, uh, we're going to uh, probably rehearse things in our minds about other people and who did what and past things that you've let go of for years. And all of a sudden, here they come up in your conversation and and uh, really it was projected out of you because of of uh, what you're thinking at the moment. And uh, again, not a God thing, okay? Not a God thing, not a devil thing. You know what? Life just happens. And how you take what God has done and revealed, imparted in you, and that, how that's reflected out really does uh, become the, um, you know, like the policeman that has authority that says stop and the, the authority backs up his hand. Uh, it, it becomes the authority in us that really does change situations for the better. Uh, Dr. Catherine, share a, a closing word with our audience, if you would. You know, I, I, one of the things that I was just kind of sensing, because I know people are suffering out there, and God does have compassion on our pain. It's not like mm-hmm. he doesn't care. He doesn't say, buck it up and, you know, believe me. But he meets us in our pain, and then he helps us through engaging with him to cause us to transcend out of our out of that first in our mind and then a lot of times as as we we kind of uh, transcend out of it not not being afraid trusting and leaning uh-huh. in, in our weakness and letting him be our strength then actually it's from that place that a lot of the external things start to change but that's not the major thing the major victory is really this place of you and him in your heart and in your mind and then you get the others. So basically you get everything, but there's no shortcut to dependency. There's no shortcut. And that's where you really know him. And there's something beautiful on the other side. So God has never left you alone in your pain. Uh, you having pain is not an indication that God's not there. And you engage with him in the midst of your pain point and God leads you through. He's so faithful. Even when you're faithless, he's faithful. You get to use his faith. Let him love you. Let him experience, let, experience that, his care in that place. Faith works by love. And as you're looking unto Jesus, he just leads you through from strength to strength to strength. He's your strength in your weakness. You're dependent on him. And that's a beautiful place to be. That's a place where you can recline in who you are in your relationship with him and beautiful fruit comes forth. There's something amazing on the other side. And just to help you get your eyes off of the temporal and mm-hmm. onto the mm-hmm. eternal, right? And and letting him help you do so. Don't beat yourself up that you're struggling, but but do turn your mind. You have that ability to choose what you're going to look at in the midst of your pain point. And God is faithful. He will see you through. Love truly never fails. 
Amen. Amen. Absolutely. And, and you know, what we're saying is if love never fails, grace never fails, hey, God never fails. He loves you. Uh, I could say that I'm his favorite child, but he's also going to say that you're his favorite child. Yeah. And so, wow. I'm uh, uh, sorry. We're all favorites. So. That's right. Isn't that amazing? Everybody can be God's favorite at the same time. It's perfect. Yeah. So only, only God can do that. Love it. Yes. Well, Dr. Catherine, this has been a great three weeks. Um, so much fun in these broadcasts. I really uh, want to thank you for being with me uh, so much. Well, it's it's always a joy. Uh, I just love uh, engaging with all these amazing things. And, you know, um, so thank you for having me on. You're most welcome. Hey, everybody. Uh, this is my last broadcast for the week. Uh, probably won't have anything impromptu over the weekend, but we'll be back next week with our Tuesday panel discussion. Really, really been, right now we're doing um, um, Killing Sacred Cows. <laughs> yeah, uh, time. yeah. Uh, Wednesday, the book of Joshua, Wednesday mornings, uh, Thursday evenings. Next week, the plan is uh, Pastor uh, Tazari um martin from borneo island uh currently in has two groups in malaysia uh is planning on being with me next thursday night that's going to be so much fun um and then um next friday let's see what's going on next friday oh pastor terry uh bench from springfield missouri is going to be with me for three weeks so so much uh, so much uh, going on we love you all uh, we will see you next time on one of our shows. All right. Have a great day. Bye-bye, everyone.